Now, this is Super Bowl weekend, and we have this weekend one of Saddleback's favorite teachers uh, here. Jason Friend, the last time he came, he did such an incredible job, we instantly made him a member of Saddleback and tried to hire him. <laughs> now, he couldn't do that, but he is back. I always told him, I told him backstage, what a friend we have in Jason. His name is Jason Friend. And uh, he, he, little pun there, very, very, very little. Uh, <laughs> He's a great man of faith, and since I am getting ready to do this series on daring faith, I wanted him to come and just do a little appetizer before I do this 10-week series that I'll be preaching on faith. So I want you to give a warm Saddleback welcome to one of our favorite uh, teachers, Jason Friend. Give him a warm welcome. Thank you so much. What an honor it is to be back in this beautiful church with such beautiful people. I am wearing the colors of my favorite Super Bowl team, the Los Angeles Lakers. <laughs> Some of you are saying, I didn't know the Lakers were in the NFL. <laughs> we are we're grateful to be here. My wife is here with me. I'm going to ask her to stand. I believe she, where is my wife, Cindy? There she is, second row. I live with five women. My wife, three daughters, and our female dog. I haven't won an argument in 10 years. We have a male cat, but he's more feminine than the dog, so he doesn't count. I am the author of a new book that is a book about faith, as a matter of fact, and let me just pause for a moment and just say, when I received the call to come, I had a previous engagement to be in another place, but I felt that when Pastor Rick had called that I needed to seriously consider talking to that other place because I felt that this message was very appropriate for here. I had no idea that you were going to begin a series called Daring Faith. I did not know that. I did not know that until I saw that in the announcements. So as I began to prepare this message, I was going to go in a different direction. I felt like it needed to be done on the topic of faith. Same book that you will see there in the screens, which is a book called Become What You Believe. That book is a book about New Testament faith. It's a book about helping people to experience miracles. If you've ever asked yourself, why we don't experience the same miracles in this country that we do in other countries of the world. This is a book that will give you the tools so that you can experience the same kind of miraculous breakthrough that they do in other parts of the world. And I want to highly recommend you get a copy of that. If you come see me out at the book table, be glad to sign it, take a picture. You want to give me a hug or give me the keys to your Shelby Mustang, whatever. I'm glad. I'm glad to do whatever I can. Now, I grew up in Big Bear Lake, California. Notice how nobody shouted out. I grew up in Big Bear Lake, California. Don't worry. Uh, we don't even have any bears in Big Bear. That's how boring Big Bear is. They all left for that big town of, uh, of uh, Victorville. And lots of stories circulate around about different things that have happened on the mountain, different people, and there's one story we tell about a little boy by the name of Johnny, and Johnny would go to school, and he was very distracted like I used to be. He had, you know, like myself, A, D, 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 lots of Ds in that uh, head of his, and he would go to class, and one day the teacher gave an assignment. He says, I want you to go and spend the weekend with your family and want you to come back Monday morning and give a report on what you've done over the weekend. And Johnny was super excited. So the, all the class goes home, they spend time with their family, they come back, and the, now the teacher knows that Johnny has a reputation for being an exaggerator, and he's, oh, pick me, pick me, and she doesn't want to pick him, so she calls on the other students, and finally he's the last one. She says, okay, Johnny, what did you do? He said, my dad and I went fishing, and we both caught 75 fish, and they all weighed 75 pounds. And she said, please, Johnny, you know that's not true. Yes, it is. My dad's an excellent fisherman. I'm even better than he is. We both caught 75 fish, and they both weigh, and they all weighed 75 pounds. She said, Johnny, what would you think if I told you that on the way to school today, as I was walking along the road, 
that a huge grizzly bear that weighed 2,000 pounds came out of nowhere, and just before he hacked my head off, a little itty-bitty dog came out of nowhere, broke his neck, killed him just to save my life. Would you believe that? He said, yes, I would. That's my dog. <laughs> now, I don't know <laughs> if you have the faith of Johnny or the self-esteem of Johnny, but today we're going to talk about this concept of faith, the faith that moves the hand of God. The number one question that I'm asked, as missionaries, my wife and I travel all around the world. We've seen poverty, we've seen suffering, but we've seen miracles. We've seen things that are unexplicable, and the number one thing that we are asked is why don't we experience or see the same miracles that we hear about in other parts of the world. Why aren't those things happening here? And what can we do to change that? Well, you're going to see a painting. Because this phenomenon didn't just take place over the last 50 years. This is something that has been building. And in this painting, you'll see the man on the left is Plato. He is pointing to the heavens he believed in two worlds, a perfect world, and he's pointing to that perfect world, which is in the heavens, but he also believed that we lived in a world of shadows. We were trapped in that imperfect world, was an imperfect reflection of that perfect world, and he almost had it right. Aristotle on the right is pointing to the elements. He's pointing to the ground, because he believed, in contrast to his teacher, that the way we discover truth is by the collection of empirical evidence through the sciences. He rejected the supernatural and said we get to truth through deduction, through the gathering of evidence. And guess which one out of those two won the philosophical battle? It was Aristotle 2,500 years ago. And his influence, being as he is the father of Western philosophy, penetrated all of Europe, came across on the boats, and landed here and embedded itself into our cultural DNA. That's why we have a separation between church and state. And we fragmentize our lives. We compartmentalize. And when we go to work, well, we check Jesus at the door because we can't take Jesus with us into the workplace. And when we take off from John Wayne Airport, we can't say, excuse me, Mr. Pilot, shouldn't we begin with a word of prayer before we fly 500 miles an hour in the dark? And we can't stop the court and say, excuse me, judge, can we open up and maybe read scripture before we begin this session and dedicate this time to God? No, we can't do that. Because we separate our spiritual lives from our material lives. And that is exactly why we don't see the kinds of miracles. Quite frankly, Aristotle taught us that seeing is believing. The anti-supernaturalism in our culture, that thing that tells us that there is no God, that there is no supernatural activity, that demons and evil do not exist, and definitely there are no miracles, that undermines faith. And where there is no faith, there are no miracles. Because we tend to fragment and compartmentalize our lives. Now Jesus comes along 500 years after Aristotle, and he says, no, 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 you got it all wrong. Seeing is not believing Believing is seeing. If you want to experience miracles, you have to believe before you see. Now why is this so important? The book of Hebrews gives us the answer. Why is faith so important? It says in the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, verse 6, and without faith, it is impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that, I love the word, and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Latins, Asians, and Africans, well, they do not fragmentize their life. They do not compartmentalize their life. They know that you can't check Jesus at the door or prevent demons from influencing the school or have an outcome on the political process. They know that God is not to be contained and that is why in Mexico, for example, if a child gets sick in a non-Christian home, they're just as likely to take that child to a witch doctor as they are to a medical doctor because, after all, the witch doctor costs less money. And this might be a spiritual problem that is causing this physical ailment. They are wired to see the natural and the supernatural. Whereas us gringos, 
Well, we tend to break up things and we compartmentalize things. Now, Paul is an excellent example for us because he could walk and chew gum at the same time. He was very, very well educated by perhaps the most educated and best rabbi in Jewish history, Gamaliel, and he taught Paul some great things, and Paul understood that there's a natural and supernatural conflict constantly, and he says in 2 Corinthians 10, 4, and 5, the weapons we fight with are not weapons of this world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. So my question to you is, what is strong faith? What is strong faith? It's believing God to do what he said he would do. It's doing what you believe God wants you to do regardless of the way you feel. It's having the faith of a child. Now we've all seen the scene when a father or a mother is in the pool, up to waist in water, looking at the child who is standing at the edge of the pool, the child has taken off his SpongeBob SquarePants floaties, and for the first time, he's going to make the leap of faith into the pool. The parent says, jump, I will catch you. Is there any logical doubt in that child's mind that the parent is capable of catching the child? No, they jump. Because they know mom or dad is capable. That child is not saying, you know, well, I have been wearing sunscreen, and it's 50 P PSF or whatever the number is, and, uh, and, and because of the oil content in this uh, sunscreen that I'm wearing is going to create an extra slick surface on my skin. So when the water hits me, there's going to be a chemical reaction, and my parent will not be able to grab me in time before I go into the water's surface. Not one child thinks that way. They think in terms of faith. And they have the faith that their parent is capable of catching them. So if you want to speak the language of God, by the way, when we get to heaven, we're all going to be speaking Spanish. So you better learn Spanish. You're going to hear a message when you, when you pick up the phone and call the Lord. When you get to heaven, it's going to say, for English, press two. <laughs> But God's first language is not English, it's not Spanish, it's not even Hebrew. His first language is faith. God speaks faith, that's why it is impossible to please him without what? Without faith. And it doesn't matter what you're facing. Strong faith, this first principle that we're talking about, is what we call seeing the invisible. Seeing the invisible, that is the first principle of faith. Being able to see the invisible. Seeing the invisible. So it doesn't matter what you're going through. If you're looking for direction, healing, deliverance, blessing, salvation, provision, or a breakthrough, trusting God to guide you is your very first step. Now I want to share with you a passage that's found in Mark chapter 8. This guy has become my hero. I love this guy. He reminds me of me. When you read this story, you'll say, I don't see the magic in it, but this has become my favorite New Testament story. Lots of things happen in this story that happen no other, no other place in the New Testament. It says in Mark chapter 8, verses 22 through 26, they came to Bethsaida, and some people brought a blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. He took the blind man by the hand and led him outside the village. When he had spit, on the man's eyes and put his hands on him, Jesus asked him, do you see anything? He looked up and said, I see people. They look like trees walking around. Once again, Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes. Then his eyes were open. His sight was restored and he saw everything clearly. Jesus sent him home saying, don't go in to the village. There's something about this village that isn't right. Mark is a very decent author, very diplomatic. He doesn't talk bad about the town. Luke, ah, he'll just tell you the way it is. Woe to you, Bethsaida. 
If they had done the miracles in Sodom and Gomorrah that they did in you, they would have repented a long time ago. Oh, Luke, he just dropped a hammer on those guys. But Mark is not that way. We just know that there's something not right. That's why Jesus leads this guy out of town to do the miracle in his life. He removed him from his context. And I've discovered, ladies and gentlemen, that many times in order for God to make the breakthrough in our life, he has to remove us from our context because our context is that which is destroying things and keeping us in the same thing. So many times God does remove us from our circumstances in order to build our faith and gain our trust. Many people in our society have no faith. Even Christians that do not trust God because their faith has been diminished to the point where it is difficult for them to see. So God leads them out of their context for the purposes of reestablishing that gaining of their trust and building their faith again. I have a friend that grew up in Costa Rica and by age 17 he decided he wanted to live the American dream. So as a good Central America, he got on a plane, he landed in Mexico City, took a bus to the border, and he crossed the border illegally. Can you believe that people actually do that? They cross the border illegally? <laughs> he hadn't even breathed gringo air for five seconds when the INS grabbed him and thrown him in the back of a patrol car and hauled him off to the youth detention center in Chula Vista. First thing he notices when they throw him into his cell is that his cell has carpeting. He looks up, he sees a color TV up in the corner of the cell that's got cable, cable TV, in jail. It's got air conditioning, climate control. It's got a bathroom, his private bathroom. He does not share that cell with anyone. He walks over to the window where he sees the airplanes landing in San Diego. He's got a view of the airport. He said the best of all is that he could go back for seconds. They had church once a week a doctor would physically check him once a week. So when his uncle came to pay his bail bond to get him out of jail, he said, no thanks, I'm staying. <laughs> he said, what do you mean? He said, are you kidding me? I got wall-to-wall -wall carpeting. I got air conditioning. I got cable TV. I got a view. I'm living the American dream. And Uncle Sam's paying the bill. I'm not, I'm not leaving, I'm staying. <laughs> Took his uncle two days to convince him that there was more freedom in, outside of prison than inside of prison. You know how many times has God tried to hit us over the head, trying to somehow convince us that if we leave our old ways, we'll have more freedom than the time before, but it is so difficult to remove us from our context? Finally, after two days, his uncle convinced him that there's more freedom outside than inside, and he gets out of jail where he goes to New York and he becomes a drug dealer. He went from one prison to the next prison, a drug dealer. Or as they say in the drug industry, an undocumented pharmacist. He begins to sell drugs, and for two years, he's involved in this activity, and he decides he needs to go back to Central America. That was the day before the police were going to show up. He boards a plane, he leaves, where he finally has that encounter, that one-on-one -on -one encounter with the Lord. Rebuilds his faith, transforms his life, saves him. He gets married years later, and 10 years after that, he became our crusade coordinator. God is a God of miracles, and he transforms lives. But many times, he has to remove us out of these contests and break those chains so that we can see things the way they truly are. The second thing that occurs, you know, the Lord used everything at his disposal because he loved this guy, and the Lord uses everything in his arsenal to save us, to deliver us, and demonstrate his love for us. Uses everything in his arsenal. Now what is the arsenal of Jesus when it comes to healing? First and foremost, folks, this is the first guy in the history of the world when Jesus lays hands on him. He's not instantly healed. Up to this moment, Jesus is batting a 1,000. Okay? You know what batting a 1,000 means? It means he's, every time he does something, they're healed. Every time. Sends a word. Lays hands on him. Says this. Does this. Spits in their eyes. They're all healed. This guy, not the case. He takes him out of town. He lays hands on him. He <laughs> spits in his eyes. And then there's silence. Like an awkward silence. This is not a silence that Jesus is used to. He's never seen this before. He's looking at this guy, and the guy's just sitting there. 
And after about five seconds, I can imagine the Lord going. And finally, in the first time in the Lord's ministry, he has to ask, and it's the only time he does ask the question, do you see anything? <laughs> and the guy says, I see people. They look like trees. Now, was it the, the Lord only had half the power that day? Didn't go by Starbucks in the morning and have his jolt? What was it that was missing here? No, it was the fact that this man's faith and trust in God had not risen to the level that it should have, which is why Jesus had to remove him from his context in the first place. The Lord was there, used everything at his disposal because he loved him. And that man's response to him is indicative of somebody who is struggling with their faith, and that's what I see when I see my American friends. People who are in a battle for faith. People who are in a battle for believing. You are not coming against a, simply a society that's, ah, oh, well, I don't know. We're coming across people who are in the battle for centuries, centuries of philosophy and thinking that is trying to eradicate the concept of faith. God uses everything in his arsenal to get us to believe. First campaign we ever held was in a marginalized community in Central America in a place called Los Cuadros, Costa Rica. It's an area filled with tin houses and cardboard shacks. People caught in poverty, in problems with prostitution and gang violence and drug addiction. We set up the platform, we put up the lights, we gave an invitation for people to come forward. Regardless of the need, we wanna pray with you. And the very first person for whom we are going to pray for is a little eight-year-old, she's an eight-year-old little girl, her name is Vivian, and she is being escorted, or better, better stated, pushed to the front by her grandmother. Now, in Latin America, the highest person in authority is probably the Pope, then the president of the country, and then grandma. <laughs> An old female in Latin America can do just about anything she wants. She is pushing that kid through that crowd. That kid emerges at the front, and I lean down to say, well, hi, sweetheart, how can I help you? Immediately, Grandma interrupts. She says, she's missing three ribs. She needs a miracle. Unless we operate on her, we took her down to the clinic today. The clinic told us unless we operate on her, she's gonna be an invalid. So we need a miracle. We don't have the money for an operation. We need a miracle. That's why we came for you to pray, because we need a miracle. And I thought, well, there's no pressure. So I leaned down and I said, well, sweetheart, do you believe the Lord can heal you? And she simply said, didn't open her mouth, she just simply said, I said, okay, we're going to pray. Because sometimes that's all you can do. So we prayed and we continued because there's 299 other people to pray for. At the end of the night, I feel someone tugging on my jacket. I turn around and it's Vivian, this little girl. And she says, yo creo que Dios me ha sanado, which means I believe the Lord has healed me. Now I notice that some of you, they, oh, and that's, I really appreciate that because I know you're with me. But you know how they respond in Cuba, in Brazil, in Argentina, in Singapore, in Africa, and every other part of the world that is not in this Western area? Do you know how they respond when I say, I believe the Lord is healing? Hallelujah! Glory to Dios! And they jump up and they carry on, they clap and they applaud because for them, they don't have any problem believing. No, no. Do you know what gringos say? They say, oh. <laughs> and we all know what oh means. It means seeing is believing. Now, I don't want you to feel bad. Because when Vivian said to me, I, I believe the Lord has healed me, I said, oh. We are constantly, as Americans, in this battle for faith. Constantly waging war in our heads. Do we believe? Or are we going to be once again fooled or lied to? Do miracles really exist? Does God really intervene? The rest of the world doesn't have the struggle that we do because we've inherited centuries of battle and ways of thinking. 
I looked over to the left, and indeed, there was a doctor. So I walked over to him, and I said, hey, doc. I said, we got a little girl here. Her name, he goes, oh, that's Vivian. She came into my clinic earlier today. You know, she's missing three ribs. Unless we operate her, we're going to have to, we, she needs, I mean, we got to operate her. She's going to be an invalid. She's not going to be able to walk. She's going to have curvature of the spine. I said, well, she tells me that she physically felt a change in her body. She believes that God has healed her. He said, well, I'd be able to verify that, because where there was a huge gaping hole where those three ribs are missing, she said, I, I'd be glad to look. And I said, well, please do. And he walks over. He asks her permission. She says, yes. She bends over. He lifts up her shirt. He begins to count by two the ribs on her back. And when he gets to the halfway point, he covers his mouth. He takes a step back. He says, that's not the same back that I looked at earlier today because where there was a huge hole, I see three brand new ribs. <laughs> a decade had passed. We were in the largest stadium in the country, expecting 25,000 people that night. Torrential downpour came in Latin America. When you're in open air and a torrential downpour comes, you can count on nobody showing up. And we had maybe 6,000 people. I was depressed. How could this happen? No one's here. Got a cost of the stadium, the cost of all these things, the logistics, the sound, the lighting. And I'm having what I call a plum party in the green room. Do you know what a plum party is? Poor little old me. <laughs> and I'm asking myself the question that every one of us has asked. From time to time, you may or may not have asked yourself, maybe you're more spiritual than I am, what in the world am I doing with my life? Is anything I do, does it really count for something significant? And the Lord really impressed upon me at that moment that I do what I do, not for numbers and not for success and not for all these things, but simply to be obedient. So I got out there and I preached a message that I believe that the Lord wanted me to share. And indeed, 1,500 people came forward. It looked like a Billy Graham event. 1,500 people come. And out of that crowd emerged one person running fast towards the stage, jumped over a concrete barricade, got past the armed guards, past the ushers, and shot up the side stairs and now walking towards me on this stage. And I said, excuse me, can I help you? She said, it's me, it's me, it's me. And I said, I don't know who me is. She said, it's me, me, Vivian. I said, Vivian, you're all, you're all grown up. And you're running, jumping over barricades and getting past armed guards. <laughs> I said, I, it's been 10 years. She said, yes. I said, what are you doing here? She said, well, we were up in Los Cuadros. We heard about the campaign. We came down just to support. But as you shared, I just felt like I need to come and share with these people about the great things that the Lord has done and desires to do. Would you please give me the microphone? I said, please. <laughs> Lord uses everything. Everything in his arsenal. To help us. And to do the miraculous in our life. And let me just say this. If you need a miracle this year. A financial miracle. A marital miracle. A family miracle. A physical miracle. A miracle with your career direction. Doesn't matter what it is. God's biggest challenge is not to do the miracle, but to somehow convince you that he is still in the business of doing miracles. That is his biggest challenge. The third thing is that the Lord served him, never abandoned him. He stuck by his side until his healing work was finished. The Lord will never abandon you, nor will he forsake you he will stick by you until his perfect work is finished. Philippians 1, 6 sums it up this way. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Let me ask a question. How many of you would say in this year, 2015, that you desperately or to a great degree need or looking for a miracle to happen in your life. Can I see a show of hands? I believe beyond the shadow of a doubt that this will be a year of miracles for Saddleback. This will be a, mirror, a year of miracles for your life and the members of this church and anyone who dares to place their faith in God. I believe that. I believe that this can be a year of breakthrough for you. Continue to place your faith in him and he will surprise you 
but the great things that he plans. About 12 months ago, I received a phone call from a friend of mine who attends Saddleback, been a lifelong member here, 20 some odd years. His name is Bob Burtwell. Bob and Sandy have been here for many years. He said, hey, Jason, I hear you're going to Cuba. Can I tag along? I said, are you sure you want to go? He said, yes. I said, well, you better fasten your seatbelt because those services are not an hour and 20 minutes. They're four-hour services. And those people, they jump up, and they don't just, they're not like getting guitos. I mean, these are, these, are people, these are people who really, really worship with all the energy. And not, not a problem, he said. I said, it's going to be about 90 degrees. He said, not a problem. I said, good. So we left Miami, we took a charter flight, we landed in Olguin. Olguin is about 450 miles to the east of the capital of Havana, about 90 minutes outside of Guantanamo. We were held two open air campaigns, which are not normally permitted, but they give us that green light. So we held these two events. The second night we had about 5,000 people, we were in a different spot. And I said to Bob, I said, hey, I want you to come on up here. And I want you to greet the people before, we'll have a translator, I want you to greet the people and just share something before I get up and speak. He said, I'd love to. He got up and this is what he said. He said, you saw all these people jumping around and waving their handkerchief and they were jumping up and down and worshiping and they were so filled with enthusiasm and joy. But maybe you're here tonight, you couldn't jump up and down, you didn't have any excitement. That's because you have not met the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. You've not given yourself and your life over to Jesus Christ. He said, tonight I want you to give your life to Jesus Christ. And when you do, you too will experience the joy and the peace. And you'll be able to wave your handkerchief and celebrate with the rest of them. Then he gave the microphone over to me, and I got up and I preached. I gave an invitation, people came forward. At the very end of the night, Bob is standing at the outskirt portion, or the very out portion of the lot, and an 18-year-old 18 18 female blonde comes walking up to him with one of her friends, and she says, I want to thank you for coming. Let me first of all tell you that tonight I gave my heart to the Lord. And let me tell you why. She said, 12 months ago, I started to have a dream. It's a dream that kept repeating itself. And there was a man, an elderly gentleman, that was on a platform. And he began to tell me that I need to give my life to Christ. And that's the only way I could experience joy and salvation. And when I saw you on that platform tonight, I recognized you as the man that God had put in my dreams. And because of your words tonight, I decided to give my life to Christ. God loved that woman so much that he sent someone from Saddleback halfway across the world to stand on a platform and inadvertently say, you too can experience the joy and peace that you see around you. Is that by chance? Is that luck? Or is it God who is the God of miracles who happens to know what he is doing? Listen, if you have never been on a missions trip, I want to highly recommend that you do that. And if you wonder how you're going to pay for that missions trip, when you begin to step out in faith, then the Lord will begin to provide the finances for you to fulfill the Great Commission. That's the way it works. The waters never part until we step into the waters. That's the way it works. Now, there's some people who say, well, I'm too old to go on the mission field. <laughs> Listen, if you can get on a cruise ship, Make the investment in missions. Allow God to use you. Your life will never be the same for it. The fourth thing, the Lord warned him not to go back to the village, but to go straight home, in essence to tell him not to go back to his old life, and the Lord warns us not to go back to our old ways. Many of us are caught in these cycles because we're caught in these old ways. We've never broken free from our old ways. And that's how I know that there is something about Bethsaida that wasn't right. The Lord removed him from the city, did the miracle, and he said, now don't go back to the city. You go back to the city, you're going to run the risk of losing the blessing that God has given you. Same is true when it comes to sin. He rescues us from sin. He breaks our patterns. We're able to walk in freedom, and suddenly we walk back to those old ways, and we lose the blessing. Don't lose the blessing. Don't lose that powerful impact that God has put on your life by simply going back to those old ways. I know this all too well. 
because I come from a crazy family. How many of you come from a crazy family? Can I see a show of hands? Unless, of course, your family members are here, then you want to keep that hand down. <laughs> when I was three, my parents were separated. When I was nine, they were divorced. When I was 15, my mom remarried somebody who was 32 years older than she was, and she was his sixth wife. He had been married so many times, he had permanent rice embedded in his forehead. <laughs> Some of you will get home this afternoon and go, oh, I get it, I get it. Between my three parents, there are nine divorces. Nine divorces. My dad's in the, in, the bar in the bartender's hall of fame. He's a bartender. Yeah. My mom was an alcoholic, so they got along fairly well. <laughs> Family of total dysfunction. And don't get me wrong. We loved each other. We love each other. Just dysfunctional. We moved to Big Bear when I'm 12 years of age. Landed in Big Bear. And my mom began to fall into alcoholism I, in such a fierce way, half a gallon of wine a night. And she literally looked for friendships and, and just, just, just struggled because of loneliness. And I don't really blame her for drinking because Big Bear is one of the most boring places on the face of the planet. <laughs> and I love the town. And in the midst of this chaotic situation, the Lord sends a Mexican family to invite me to church with them. Okay, I had never, 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 never. Do you know what the word never means in Greek? It means never. <laughs> never been to a Protestant church in my life. Never. And these folks were militant Christians. Do you know what I mean by militant Christians? They were always sitting in the front row. And they carried a Bible big enough to be considered a concealed weapon. And they got to church 15 or 20 minutes early. And they hauled me all the way down to the front row. I didn't want to sit in the front row. As a visitor, I wanted to sit in the parking lot. <laughs> hauled me down to the front row, and as soon as my tush hit that pew, can you say tush? Is that acceptable? Is that politically correct? Listen, if someone has given you a copy of this CD, and the word tush is an offense to you, you're driving down the freeway, you're listening to this CD, the word tush is an offense to you, I want you to make an appointment, I want you to come in and see me, my name is Pastor Rick Warren, I pastor Saddleback Church, and we'll set the record straight. I feel so much better now that I got that off my chest. Glad we could get that behind us. Soon as my... That was an unintentional pun. <laughs> as soon as my backside hit the pew, a three-block radius around that church lost all power. A blackout, three blocks around the church. The church was the center, three blocks around. You think I'm exaggerating? No exaggeration. My dad, who's quite the jokester as a bartender, used to say, you know, if I ever walked into a church, surely the building would collapse. I thought, man, my dad is a prophet. Now, we have an unspoken rule when we take people to church. And that is our job as the invitee to invite, well, the invite or to invite the invitee and tell the invitee, make the invitee feel comfortable, right? That's our job. Do you know what my buddy said to me? My best friend, he says, you know, that's never happened in the history of this church until you walk through the door. <laughs> the pastor called for the ushers to light candles and they lit candles. We had a candlelight service, 6 o'clock that night, some date in February, many, many moons ago, snow lightly falling, 25 degree weather outside, and he opens his Bible and he says, reading John 8, 36, if the sun sets you free, you'll be free indeed. And for me, for the very first time in my life, I heard good news, that I didn't have to be perfect to come to Christ. I didn't have to be a holy person to get my life right. That the Lord was inviting me to leave my context, to walk out of my circumstance, to be able to see for the very first time in my life. He took me and he led me by the hand, but he also warned me. He said, don't go back to the old ways of thinking. Don't go back to your old ways. Be born again. 
and experience the miraculous life that God has for you. And 30 years later, I stand before you, not because of talent or intelligence, because of the grace of God. God's miracle working power, it does work. It may work in fast motion or slow motion, but friend, he does transform lives and he does the miracles. I, beyond the, I believe beyond the shadow of a doubt that this will be a year of miracles. And with this, I close. I do not preach long. I keep it short because I believe in that age-old proverb that says, blessed are the short-winded, for they will be invited back. You have a communications card. I want you to take that communications card in there. And if you need a miracle or have a need, you write that need down. If God has spoken to you to be involved in missions, then you check that as well. But most importantly, if you need this year to begin right, you need to begin a relationship with Jesus Christ. You understand that you have been caught in your old ways, but you want to break free. When you saw 2014 disappear in the horizon, you weren't celebrating over a great year. You realized that you were glad to see that year buried. You can make this year one of the best years of your life. Give your life to Jesus, and your life will never be the same. If you want to reconcile your life and rededicate your life, I want you to check that box. And we're going to pray for miracles, for your life, for your salvation, and for the call that God has placed on your life. Father, I thank you for your wonderful presence. And I ask, Lord, in Jesus' mighty name, that you would indeed set the captive free. Lead us out of our context. Lead us, Lord, out of our circumstance so that we can experience your power and your grace. Lord, we pray for the breakthrough to come. We pray, Lord, that you would demonstrate your power and that you would transform lives here this day. And friend, if you do need a miracle and you raised your hand before, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand as I continue to pray. Lord, you see these hands going up all across this sanctuary in this room. And I ask that you would intervene divinely and sovereignly in these lives. Bring healing to them. Bring deliverance to them. Bring focus and direction into their lives. Bring newness and bring hope. Give them, Lord, your wisdom. And allow them to experience your breakthrough. And I thank you in Jesus' name. And for those who are rededicating their lives to you today. Or for the very first time feeling that they need to know you. I ask, Lord, that you give them the strength and give them connection in this church. To grow in your ways. And to never look back or go into the town again. And I thank you for these wonderful people. And I bless them. We bless them because they have opened their hearts to us. We love and appreciate them, and I ask that you would be with them. Give them your peace, your hope, and give them a phenomenal 2015. In Jesus' mighty name, and all God's people said, amen. Thank you so much. God bless you.